when you meditate, you find yourself talking to yourself a lot. And there's not just one voice in there. There are many voices. There's the commentator, and there's the commentator on the commentator. And that can go back in many levels. And one of our main problems as meditators is we don't know how to talk to ourselves. We don't know how to manage the conversation in a way that's going to be actually helpful. We think that the mind should be still and there shouldn't be any thoughts at all, and there's a voice here and a voice there. And something inside you will say, okay, it shouldn't be this way. Well, maybe that voice doesn't know anything either. As the Buddha said, direct a thought and evaluation are a factor in the first jhana. And it's part of the training in meditation, is learn how, learn how to talk to yourself, because direct a thought and evaluation are basically your way of formulating ideas in the mind, talking to yourself. So you want to talk to yourself in a way that brings the mind to stillness, and then helps it keep it there. And so it's good to know a few ground rules. One is don't comment on yourself as a meditator. Comment on the actions. Particularly avoid comments that either get you really depressed and discouraged, or they get you complacent and you think you're pretty hot stuff. Well, that's setting yourself up for a fall. But even worse is the, the voice that says, this is no good and am I getting anywhere? You especially have to watch out for this voice if the meditation has been going well and all of a sudden it's not going well at all. It seems like you're starting back at square one, although it's worse than square one. Because when you originally started with square one, there was some hope, but now it seems hopeless. So watch out for that voice. Don't listen to it. And John Mahabhava tells that when he was getting started in his meditation, he could see that his mind would progress and get more and more still, and then it would just all fall apart. And then it would start progressing again, and then it would fall apart again. And he was really worried about it, so once it started to progress, he would do everything he could to protect it, and it would still fall apart. And finally he decided to change the conversation. Instead of talking to himself about the progress and regress of the mind, he said, I'll just stick with the meditation, and regardless whether things go well or not, I'm just going to stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. And he found that by not getting wound up in measuring his progress as a meditator, things actually got better. So you have to have the attitude that regardless of the ups and downs, you're not going to let your inner commentator get up or down. In other words, when things are going well, make sure you're not complacent. When things are not going well, don't get discouraged. Learn how to give yourself some encouragement. Now remember that ups and downs are a normal part of the meditation. The mind is a very complex phenomenon. As we all know about complex systems, it's like the weather. It's not the case that as you move from winter to summer, every day it just gets gradually a little bit warmer and warmer and warmer, and then you move from summer to winter and it gets gradually just a little bit cooler and cooler. There are ups and downs. You have heat waves and cold waves. It's because the system is so complex. Well, the mind is complex too, so just take it in stride. That when things are not going well, this is just a temporary trough. And you try to figure out what you can do to keep your morale up. And that will often be exactly what you need to get out of the doldrums and to get your meditation sailing again. But in particular, watch out for the voice that says, I'm no good as a meditator. This is hopeless. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the voice that seems negative may often seem to be the most realistic. But remember, there are two kinds of truths, what William James talked about. He didn't give terms to them, but one of them could be called the truth of the observer, things that are true simply when you watch them. It has nothing to do with your wants. 
In fact, if you once get involved, you can't really see the truth. Like figuring out the, the laws of science. You can't want the law to be a certain way. If you want it to be a certain way, then that's going to skew the results of your experiments. You have to design the experiment and say, okay, I just want to see what happens. That's one kind of truth. There's another kind of truth, though. That's the truth of the will. And these kind of truths become true only when you want them to be true. If you want to be a good musician, if you want to be a good sportsman, if you want to be a good cook, it's not going to happen if you don't want it. It's your desire that makes it happen. Remember, the path is largely a truth of the will. You have to learn how to keep encouraging yourself. As the Buddha says, you generate desire. That's part of right effort. You encourage the mind. So that's one of the first ground rules. Don't let yourself get overcome by negative comments about your own abilities. Try to speak to yourself in more positive ways that are more encouraging. And remember that ups and downs are normal. And don't let yourself get discouraged by the downs. When things aren't going well, focus back on the causes. What are the causes? You watch the breath. You learn how to be not too great a hurry to get the results. Patience is required. Another ground rule is you have to know when to not talk to yourself. One of the times is you try different things with the breath and nothing seems to work. The mind doesn't want to settle down. Nothing seems to work at all. That's a time to be quiet. Just say, okay, I'm going to watch. And whatever conversation goes on, is just, okay, watch, watch. Don't jump to conclusions. Let's just watch what happens. What's going on with the breath? What's going on with the mind? If you're constantly commenting, it gets in the way of seeing what else is going on in the mind on a deeper level. There may be an issue that's left over from the day that you have, that you have to deal with first before it's going to be willing to settle down. And you're not going to see it if you're constantly commenting. So when nothing seems to make sense, nothing seems to work in the meditation, just say, okay, be very still and watch. And that can be your conversation. Just watch, watch. The other time to be still is when the mind does settle down. And there's a tendency to ask, well, what's next? What's next? And you say, nothing. This is what's next. Staying here. Learning how to develop this as a skill. Because there does come a point where you've adjusted the breath until it's good enough for the mind to settle down. And John Fuang's analogy is of putting water in a water jar. You keep adding water, adding water, adding water, and finally the jar is full. And if you keep on adding water, whatever you add is just going to spill out. Things are just right as they are, so now you allow yourself to stay with just right. It's at this point where the conversation gets a lot simpler. You don't have to do so much adjusting. You don't have to try to figure things out. You just try to stay right here, stay right here. It's a little conversation. It's very simple. Are we here? Yes, fine. Are we here? Yes, fine. That's it. It's like the harmoniums and sirens of Titan. Those are the inhabitants of Mercury that feed off the vibrations of Mercury, which in that novel is like a large honeycomb crystal. And because the beings don't have to feed off each other, they live a very peaceful, friendly life together. They feed off the vibrations of the crystal, and they send out two messages. One is, here I am, here I am, here I am. The other one is, so glad you are, so glad you are. When the mind finally settles down, that's the kind of level of conversation you have. It's very minimal, and you don't even have full sentences, it's just breath, breath, breath. Occasionally you check to see if it's going well, if it's going well, okay, good, and then breath, 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 that's it. But before you get there, there has to be a certain amount of conversation. So learn how to speak to yourself in a way that's encouraging. 
try to listen to the voices that help with your ingenuity, that help with your powers of observation, that help make you content to stay here. Even when things aren't going well, try to find ways of making yourself content. There's that story they tell of the explorers who went across the wastes of the Northwest Territories. There's one guy in particular, an Englishman, who wanted to check out a copper source that he'd heard of. He couldn't find any way to get there except to go with a band of Dene, which are the relatives of the Navajos up in Canada. And he noticed that in the days when food was scarce, the hunting was not good and well, and they had to cinch their belts a little tighter. Those were the days when they joked the most among themselves. In other words, they did what they could to keep their spirits up. So learn how to keep your spirits up as you're meditating, even when things don't seem to be going well. Don't let the temporary setbacks get you down. Remember, these are temporary. There's no such thing as a permanent setback. As we're saying today, even death sets you back a little bit. But if you've got the momentum for your practice, so you can keep on going. And here we haven't, haven't even died. You're still alive, you're still meditating. There's hope. So learn how to talk to yourself in a way that's really productive, that's really conducive to getting the mind in shape. This is one of the most important skills you need to develop as a meditator, training the commentator, training the commentator class, you might call them, all those levels of commenting that are going on in the mind. Remember that they're an important part of the meditation, too. <laughs>